to read one verse to put a foundation for my message, and we'll go from there. Hallelujah. We'll pray then. So, uh, let's go to Leviticus, the 27th chapter, verse 32. And here's where our first introduction is to passing under the rod. And beloved, we're all going to pass under his rod today, this morning. We're going to pass under his rod. You have your Bibles, choir? Yes, good. Everyone, wonderful. Verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. All right, hear it again. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come upon me with might and power and authority. I have nothing of myself, but through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost, the word shall go forth, unadulterated, pure, and holy. Sanctify me, Jesus. Purge me. I take your authority over every demon power, every principality and power of darkness, because nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of God from going forth today. Nothing. God, let us have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to hear the living word of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, I've introduced to you now a Holy Ghost concept called the tithing rod. All the flock of a sheep, if someone was going to tithe his flock, and all flocks, all herds had to be tithed, they would take the herd into the sheep coat, and there'd be a narrow door, and there would be a tenth sacrificed unto the Lord, given unto the Lord. The tenth was tapped and given to the Levites. It was a holy, uh, uh, the, the, there was a rod that the Levite had, a long rod, and he dipped it in vermilion, that's red paint, or okra, and every tenth was tapped with that red paint and belonged unto the Lord. In fact, the rabbinate describes it like this. When a man was to give the tithe of his sheep or calves to God, he was to shut up the whole flock in one fold, in which there was one narrow door capable of letting out one sheep at a time. The owner stood by the door with a rod in his hand, the end of which was dipped in vermilion or red ochre, when the tenth one came, he touched it with the red color, and it was received as the legitimate tithe. He was not to see whether it was strong, weak, or anything else. Even if it was a weak one, it would pass through, and God would touch it, it would belong unto the Lord. Now, I want you to go to Ezekiel 20. And you're going to see prophetically how this is prophesied to happen in every generation, especially the last day. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel 20. Folks are going to go through a lot of scriptures, so bear with us. Ezekiel 20. You might want to write these scriptures down as you go. I hope you have a pen. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Now, I want you to go to verse 37, please. Verse 37. I hear the leaves still rustling. I'll wait for just a moment. Ezekiel 20, verse 37. Here it is. I will cause you... What? to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will cause you to pass under the rod. All right, God's going to she separate sheep from sheep. Go over to Ezekiel 34. Turn right, Ezekiel 34. Let's begin verse 22. Let's go to verse 20. Ezekiel 34, verse 20. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle, between the lean cattle, because you have thrust with the side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns to have scattered them abroad. Verse 22. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall be no more prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. How many see that? I will judge between cattle and cattle. Now, folks, something is awesome and terrific, uh, terrifying is happening here in what I've read to you now. He's judging between sheep and sheep. Now, I want you to know before I go any further that many Christians are not going to heaven. Those who call themselves Christian, many who believe they are sheep, are not going to be saved. They are not going to have the red touch of God's mark. They're not going to be tapped. Only a remnant, the Bible says, only a remnant. 
If every generation, only a remnant has come through. And this is very important to understand. And the Lord now says, I'm going to gather my people. Now remember, there's a final judgment day when we all stand before God. But he said before then, judgment will begin in the house of God. There's a judgment that begins before the final judgment, and that judgment is already underway, beginning in the house of God and among the ministry and then all over the body of Jesus Christ. And that is happening now. He said he's going to gather his sheep into a valley of decision. Now, folks, many have believed that the valley of decision is whether or not you or I am going to decide to follow Jesus. That's not what the valley of decision is about at all. The valley of decision is the decision he's going to make, who is going to be tapped, who passing under the rod is going to get the mark. The valley of decision is his decision, it's not ours. It's those whose hearts are perfect toward him, those that he sees and he says, that's mine, tap, put the mark on, that is mine. That sheep belongs to me, that sheep is going to green pastures. And we'll talk about where it goes. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Joel 3, 14 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, the stars will lose their brightness, and the Lord will roar out of, out of Zion. And that's exactly, he said he's coming, and Yahweh will judge. Yahweh is Jehovah. Now, why are all these being gathered right now to be judged? Look at Ezekiel 20. Go back to Ezekiel 20. I want you to uh, read verse 33, begin with verse 33 now. And here's the picture. Get this picture in your mind, please. As I live, saith the Lord God, surety with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people, will gather you, the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the hand of Egypt, land of Egypt. And so I will plead with you, saith the Lord, and I will there cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Look at me, please. God says in the last day, and this is uh, Jeremiah saw it, Isaiah saw it, Ezekiel saw it, all the prophets saw a gathering of God's people before the final judgment, where the Lord would decide who were His. And some would be cast into a situation that will be described as we go on a little further here today. Now, of course, the day is coming. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's a great gathering. Every one of us must appear before God in Zion, according to Psalms 84, 7. But Christ is gathering his church right now in the wilderness of judgment. He's going to undertake a one-on-one -on -one face to face judgment. He said, I shall judge you face to face, Ezekiel 20:35. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. And I'm telling you that that judgment has already begun. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? The judgment first in the house of God. The Lord arises to contend, and he arises to judge his own people. The Lord enters into judgment with his elders and the princes of the people. And the reason was because they have what I call the spirit of Herod, who heard John the Baptist gladly, but obeyed nothing he said. And the Lord says there are going to be many in the last days who come and love to hear the prophets. They love to hear the watchman warn. They love to hear the sound of powerful preaching. They love it in their hearts, but they go out and disobey, and it never changes their lives. God is now contending with his household because nothing seems to move many of his children anymore. The trumpets are sounding of the prophets. The watchmen are crying out their warnings. The end of all things is at hand. And yet the majority of God's people are still at ease. They are not hearing the word of God. And God says, I've had enough and I'm going to bring my people into judgment. I'm going to bring them and I'm going to search their hearts. And he's now contending with his household. Why don't you go left to Ezekiel 7. Ezekiel 7. Verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou son of man, 
Thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And my eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thy abominations shall be in the midst of thee. You shall know that I am the Lord God. Look at verse 14. Speaking of the watchmen and the prophets, they have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. Folks, look around you. What do you hear? What are you hearing in your spirit? It's one who says, I'm a child of God. What are you hearing? Are you hearing the trumpets? Are you hearing what the prophets are saying? Are you seeing what's happening to the nation and the world? Wars and rumors of wars all over. Yugoslavia is gone. Russia is torn apart. Ethnic wars all over the face of the earth. Are you hearing the sound of the trumpet? The watchman is warned. I've stood in this pulpit now for seven years as a watchman. I've heard people say there's no prophetic message from this pulpit. There's been an everlasting prophetic message from this pulpit. There's a prophetic message going out to your heart this very moment. You've been listening to the watchmen. The watchmen are warning. They're sending letters. They're sending messages. They're on radio. They're everywhere warning that the end has come. Judgment is at the door. Our nation is collapsing right under our noses. Why are people sitting in front of their television sets laughing? Why are people no more awake? Why are people still lazy and not seeking the face of God? Do you hear the sound of the trumpet? I hear it in my heart. I've heard it and I'll never stop hearing it. God help us when we quit hearing the sound of the trumpet. He said the trumpets are blaring, but people are not going out to the battle. Why aren't Christians forsaking their idols? I want you to go to Ezekiel 8. You said you love the word, beloved? Verse 17. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. They've returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the brands to their nose. Therefore also I will deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Look at me, folks. Here's what the prophet is saying. He said, the warnings have gone forth. God has proclaimed that he's coming soon. He's proclaimed the warning. The watchmen have warned. But the people who are holding on to their sins were, were putting a twig to their nose. And in, in those days in this society, the worst thing that you could do to show disrespect was to pick up a twig, hold it under your nose and flip it. Now, we don't use the twig. We use the thumb. And what God's saying, my people are thumbing their nose at me. They're thumbing their nose at my word and my warnings. They're not listening. They're putting the twig to their nose. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And Lord, they put the brands to their nose. They put the brands to their nose. Now, none of us believe that we're like that. None of us believe. But folks, when you hear the word and don't obey the word and just let it slots off and go your own way, it's putting a thumb to your nose at God. That's what the scriptures say. You're thumbing your nose at me. The Lord says, come out from among them, be ye separate and clean. Touch not the unclean thing and have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Shun the very appearance of evil. Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. And yet we still have Christians who know that and sit under Holy Ghost preaching and can sit in the presence of an awesome God and the Lord Jesus can be manifesting His presence and they walk right out and they're not married and yet they're going to bed with their sweethearts. There are Christians that come to this church and go to some of the dirtiest, filthiest movies in this city. I don't know how you can say that you are not thumbing your nose at God when you can sit and watch any kind of a movie where God's name is taken in vain, where the name of Jesus Christ is mocked and ridiculed, and you sit there and you take it. You don't walk out of that movie. You're thumbing your nose at him, he said. You're thumbing your nose at him. Porno, lust, gossip, slander, 
singing about light while still walking in darkness. God said, I'll deal with you in anger, not sparing, no pity. I'll put an end to this abomination. And the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of that marking of sheep in the spiritual realm. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9 now. And I want to show you another marking that's awesome. Ezekiel 9. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charged over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man with a, a slaughter weapon in his hand. Now look this, folks. There's six angels there, and they have slaughtering weapons in their hands. But one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshing hold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. The Lord said unto him, Go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon the foreheads of who? Of the men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But not, come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. Folks, look at me, please. That never happened literally, will never happen literally ever. This is a spiritual picture the prophet Ezekiel is seeing down the quarters of time to our very day. And there are six men, six angels are going forth because God is judging his people now. He's marking those who belong to him. He said, I want you to go through the city. The city is the city of God. That's us, the new Jerusalem, those who claim to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the Lord is saying, go through this people. Go among them and find those whose hearts are sighing and crying over the sins in this house. The sins of the world, the sins of God's people, the sins of their own heart. Go put a mark on their forehead because they are mine. And so the angel of the Lord goes through the whole place and he puts a mark on the foreheads of those that belong to him who sigh and cry over the abominations. First of all, the abomination of their own hearts. Folks, I have never been able to preach against sin in this pulpit till I've examined my own heart before God. And there has to be in every one of us the examining of our hearts. There has to be an openness to the Lord. Because, beloved, He's coming to mark those who sigh and cry. First over their own abominations, and then over the abominations in the church and in the abominations in the land and in the world itself. Do you sigh and cry over those abominations? Are you sighing and crying over your own? But then he says, those who are not marked have no pity, don't spare, and put the slaughtering mark upon them. Now, folks, what that means spiritually is a slaughtered life. It means a life of despair, despondency, depression. A terrible slaughtering a slumbering, blind sheep passing under the rod one by one. Now, oh, folks, I want you to get this picture. Ezekiel sees it. Jeremiah saw it. And I'm seeing it, and I want you to see this picture. <clears throat> We're gathered in this one great sheepfold, and there's one door. And the Holy Ghost stands there. Jesus is watching the sheep go by. And the sheep are going under the rod, because the rod is just stretched out. It, it falls and taps certain ones. And here come the sheep passing by. And the, the shepherd would, could be pastor. He said, no, 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 that, mock that one. What, what a wonderful person. And the Lord says, no. He prophesied, he cast out demons, he did mighty works. I don't even know him, pass it. Yeah, but Lord, she prophesied, she spoke in tongues. She looked so holy. 
She's full of bitterness. Yes. Here they come, one after another, they go by. And every once in a while, down comes the rod and the red paint on the sheep. They're passing by. The Lord said, no, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't mark that one. Slander. Gossip. Never will change. Move. But Lord, he's a preacher. He preaches with such fire. The strong man was never bound. He gave his sins, but he didn't bind the strong man. Move him. There's so many going by, Ezekiel cries. Lord, too many righteous, too many are going by. Are you going to damn them all? Go to Ezekiel 20. Verse 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I'll bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go you, serve every one to his idols. Because you see, those sheep that are not being marked, he says, send them out. Let them go to their idols. They won't change. Let them alone. Jeremiah, all you're preaching, Ezekiel, all you're preaching can't affect them anymore. Let them go. Let them go to their, let them go out to the mountains and to the rocks. Let them go out to their shattered lives. But they're not mine. Go, you serve everyone his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9. Verse 8. Let, let's start with verse 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Verse 8. It came to pass while well, they were slaying them, and I was left. I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and is full of blood in the city of perverses. And they said, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Ezekiel is crying out, O oh God, so few are being marked. So few, so few were being marked. Are you going to slay them all? The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very great, and it's filled with blood. And the Lord commanded the marking angel to begin in the sanctuary. God showed Malachi that the ministry first would be melted and purified, and he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver so that they may be presented to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And folks, that purifying process is happening in all of us right now, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. I want you to go to Jeremiah 6. Because some people who are going to be purified and put in the fire, 
are going to hold on to their iniquity, and the Lord is going to reject them even though they go through the fire. Jeremiah 6. Now, folks, I want you to get this picture clear in your mind, if you will, please. Beginning verse 27, Jeremiah 6. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and to try them. The Lord said, I'm going to test my people. They're all grievous revolters walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are corruptors. The bellows are burned. The Lord said, I'm going to turn up the fire. I'm going to heat it with my bellows. The lead is consumed. He's putting us into the fire. And the founder melteth it in vain, for the wicked are not plucked out. In other words, the wickedness of the heart is not surrendered. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, folks, that's a picture of many people going to be tested and going into the fire, and they're not going to let go of their of their sins. They're not going to let go. And the Lord says they're going to be rejected because they can't be refined anymore. They are rejected silver, according to the Scripture. Look at Jeremiah, go to Jeremiah 8. Verse 5 and 6. Why then is this people of Jerusalem backslidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to seat, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes to the battle. The Lord says, there, there will be a people in the last days who don't acknowledge any sin whatsoever, say, what have I done? God help me. God help all of us to acknowledge our sins before the Lord, before we pass under the rod. And folks, the Bible talks about a dread release, that there are going to be some. I know people don't like to hear this, but you know he said not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. And that there's going to be a blindness, there's going to be a deception fall upon many, many Christians. God help us, I've got to, to, to get this through to your spirit somehow. I want you to go to Ezekiel 20 again, back to Ezekiel 20. Look at verse 38 again. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Now, folks, that's often rebellion in our own hearts. It's a spiritual condition that many of us are going through. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter the land of Israel. You shall know that I'm the Lord. The Lord says they're not going to go into fullness whatsoever. And God talks about giving them over to a dread release, to a shattered life. Remember what the Scripture says in Romans that there were a people who knew God but didn't acknowledge Him as God. And they had a form of godliness without the power. And he says God gave them over to reprobate minds. He gave them over to reprobate men who once knew God. But they were filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip. Without understanding, unloving, unmerciful, insolent, arrogant, boasters, disobedient, inventors of evil. Folks, that's the shattered life that people are given over to when they pass out of this sheepfold into this shattered way of living. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossipers, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness without power. Gave a whole Laodicea in church over to a dread release. He said, because you're neither hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God just gave them over. He gave a whole church over to a dread release. He said, no, you say you don't have need, you don't see your need. He said, I turn you over. He spit them out of his mouth. And I say, there are millions of sin-bound Christians are going to go to hell, including men who claim, many who claim to be spirit-filled, because their lives mock holiness. There's no brokenness. But folks, I want to 
tell you that God's going to have a remnant in the last days. He's going to have a holy remnant. And when they pass through, the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, Mark it. Mark him. Mark her. And down comes the rod. Marks. And these who are marked go with the shepherd into green pastures. They're, they're held here on the side till all are marked. And they're led off to green pastures because the word rod here in Hebrew is shebet, the same word used in the rod of Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because those whose hearts are right with God, who sigh and cry with their abominations, who acknowledge their sins, are walking in righteousness before the Lord. The Lord knows them and He's going to mark them. And they're going to follow that rod. They don't fear that rod. That rod's a comfort to them because it marked them. And that rod is going to lead them into green pastures beside still waters. It's the same word, that same rod. Folks, if you're walking in righteousness, you need not fear judgment. You need not sit here and fear my preaching. You need not hear, fear any man's preaching. If your heart is right with God, if your ear is clean, your heart is clean, there's no poison in your system, you never, never fear. You should rejoice in what I'm preaching right now because your heart is right with God and you know when you pass under the rod. That blood, red, that red is the blood of Jesus Christ. And there are many who've claimed the blood of Jesus Christ. They've given up sex, they've given up lust, they've given up habits, but they've never bound the strong man, Satan himself. He has to be bound and then he will spoil his goods. Have you had Satan bound in your spirit? Have you had him bound in your heart? Oh, hallelujah. Verse 40, chapter 20 of Ezekiel. For in my holy mountain, in the mountains of the height of Israel, saith the Lord, there shall the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. I will accept them, and, the, I, and there will I require your offerings and first fruits. I will accept you with your sweet savor, and I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered. Sanctify you before the heathen. God says, I'm going to have a holy remnant that are going to be my testimony before the heathen in the last days. They're going to be marked. And you know where they're going to follow him? Song of Solomon, my beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flocks in the gardens. I'm my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock is among the lilies. Hallelujah. I wonder how many in this house, I wonder how many of you are going to be led. You're going to be passing under the rod and you're going to be marked because the Lord says, He... She, there's no other desire but me. There's one who's not looking to people. There's one who's not looking to anyone but me. There's one who's totally dependent and cast upon me. Whose clean hands and pure heart, and spirit, and mind, and body. This is mine. This is the holy remnant that's going to rise in the last days. Sighing and crying over the abominations. And the Lord's going to use that holy remnant to be his example in the last day, to be his testimony. Folks, I don't know about you, but I, I don't have time for any of the foolishness anymore because I want his mark on my forehead. I want to be marked by that precious lamb. I want the Holy Spirit to bring that rod down on my back. I want that mark on my neck. Ezekiel twenty forty three, And here's the real testimony Folks, here's whether you can tell whether or not you've received the mark. And these shall, uh, verse 42 first, Ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into land, into the country which I lifted up my hand to give to your fathers. There shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have defiled. You shall loathe yourself in your own sight for all your evils that you've committed. Folks, that's repentance. That's total repentance. You look at your life and so God point out anything that's unlike you and loathe it. You make all your wrongs right and you don't walk among the people as if you're some holy righteous person. You go among the people in your own weakness because that's when his strength is made perfect. 
And you loathe yourself, you loathe your sins, and you live in that loathing. Oh God, by your grace alone you saved me. By your grace alone. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no better than the worst sinner in this city except by the blood of the Lamb and because my heart has been made to reach out to you, oh God. Love it, we're passing under the rod. You know what uh, shook me up? I was reading Paul, what Paul said to the church. He said that I may present you as a chaste virgin. Now, for, he didn't say as a virgin. There are a lot of virgins. Remember, there were ten virgins and five were lost. It's not enough to be a virgin. In other words, you say, I belong to Jesus. Because you can be a virgin and still lust. You may not have committed the act, but you lust in your mind. But you see, he didn't say, I want to present you as a virgin. I'm not interested in presenting you as a virgin to Christ alone. He said, I chaste virgin, absolutely pure in mind and body and spirit. That I may present you a chaste virgin. Folks, this is not a popularity contest. It has nothing to do with personalities. God called me to New York City for one purpose. And he empowered me to do it. And that's to raise up a chaste bride. Holy and pure and sanctified. I'm not here to get you to love me or I'd love to be loved. I'm not here to in a popularity contest or get anybody to love me. I have to stand before a holy God. I have to have my own hands clean and pure. I'll stand against slander. I'll stand against anything. But I will not let anything hinder me from my call to present you as a chaste virgin before a holy God. You have to stand before Christ. I'll suffer anything. I'll go through anything. But I'm going to stand before you on the judgment. I have to be there as a shepherd. And if this is your church and you belong here, I'm a shepherd. And I have to be called before God and I'm going to be there when you pass under that rod. And many of you I'd like to see touched. I'd say, God, no, please don't let that go. Don't let her go. Don't let him go. Please, Lord, that's my friend. That's my loved one. That's Don't let it happen. And I can't stop it. I can only go up to the point where you pass. And you and I are going to pass under a rod. Say what you will about me. I will stand here between you and hell. Between you and the devil. And I'm not going to let you go without a fight. And you're going to know when you stand before God. There were shepherds in this pulpit who fought every demon in hell for you. Who fought against all the principalities and powers. And gave you the truth. And prophesied to you. And gave you the holy word of God. And stood before you and hell itself and said, stop. Because I don't want you to pass under that rod and go screaming out into a wilderness of despair. The sad thing is some of you will never change. No matter what I preach, no matter who preaches, you won't change. Because you've already committed. But he said those who loathe their sins and hate them. David said, Yes, for God, they're under the blood. He forgets, but I don't. David said, my sin is ever before me. I can't forget anything I've done against him. And I loathe my past. I loathe everything I did against him. And that keeps me broken before him. Do I make mistakes? You bet I do. The one thing I know... God sent me here. God set up this house as a testimony to the whole world that in the last days there will be a godly, pure, and holy people who live in Babylon, who live in one of the worst cities in the world and are, have clean hands and a pure heart. Hallelujah. And walk in repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Bless you, Jesus. Do you need to repent? Balcony, main floor. Do you need to repent? Can you pass under the rod this morning? Are you really sure the rod comes down with that red mark? Oh, God, help you to examine your heart. God, examine us by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Examine us. Search our hearts. Oh, God, don't let us say, what have I done? Don't let us say, I've done nothing. Let us say, oh, God, I loathe myself in your presence. Show me my iniquities. Show me the air of my ways, oh, God. Hallelujah. And heal this afternoon. Heal this morning. Bring great healing. Bring restoration. Lord, you want to heal every broken heart in this place this morning. We stand. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to open the altars. If you need repentance, come on. Just get out of your seat. Balcony, go to either stairs on the other side and just come. And when you come up here, just pour your heart out. Say, Jesus, help me. Oh, God, cleanse me. Purge me. Sanctify me. I repent. Lord, I repent. If you have sin, if you sinned against God or your brother, Move in closer. A lot of people coming. Move in real close, if you will, please. Please move in tight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, pass us under your rod and mark us. Put a mark on our foreheads, Lord. Put a mark on our neck. (laughs) Folks, in the standard, don't let me put words in your mouth. Come on, have it out with God. You know what to do. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come on, call on him right now. God, come by your your grace and your mercy. He's merciful. If you'll cry out, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me and heal me. Oh, Jesus, help us as we pass under the rod. Lord, don't pass us by. Don't pass us by this morning. Hallelujah. Don't pass this by, Lord. (laughs) You that have come forward, raise both hands to the Lord. Lift it up. Lift up to the Lord. Lift up your hands. Bible says, would every man lift holy hands? All right, lift your hands. Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, Jesus. I need your touch. I need your forgiveness. I I repent repent. of all wickedness, of all rebellion, of all slander. If anything, it's son like you. Cleanse me, Jesus. Oh, God, I want to be yours. I want to be your sheep. I want to be of your fold. Fill my heart. Touch me. Touch me today because I need you. And I'm reaching to you, Lord. And I have truly repented with all my heart. Now reach out and just love him because he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, forgive and cleanse and heal now your people. Heal and sanctify and purge by your grace, Lord. Do a wonderful work in hearts. <clears throat> do a wonderful work in hearts. Lord, I pray right now there be true repentance. True repentance. Hallelujah. Lord, take all rebellion out of our hearts against you. Lord, we're not rebel against you. 
we thank you, Lord, that you take everything that's of this world out. Those, Lord, who are bound by sin, break the power of that sin. We come against principalities and powers of darkness. We come against lying spirits who would try to hold people in their lust. Break those spirits of lust. Break those chains that bind. Break them, O oh God. Let there be a freedom in the house of God. Freedom against all sin. Now, will you just thank him in your own words? Just give him thanks. The charismatic itch. Now, friends, I, uh, I hope someday Jesus will give me a ministry of just blessing people. Because I'm getting tired of the criticism. Well, for example, I, I said in this vision that I foresee a time of persecution coming such as the world has never witnessed. Jesus said, they persecuted me and they persecuted you. And he's given you a blessing now to get you ready. We've moved away from the age of Aquarius to the age of persecution already. I've been warning the charismatic Catholic movement that the Pope and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church will eventually turn on their movement. There would, become, there would, there would be launched a neo-Catholic charismatic movement. It would not die. It would grow, but it would have to go underground. Whether that's the death of this pope and a new pope coming, I don't know. But right now, friends, that's happening. I can produce right now all kinds of, of articles in the Catholic Weekly and all kinds of magazines decrying what happened at Notre Dame when uh, thousands of charismatic uh, Catholics gathered. They say, we don't need that, we don't want it, they don't want us, we don't want them. Crying now for that movement to be evicted from the Catholic Church. That's coming, that's coming, it's coming. And so many, many have said, well, uh, you wrote a book, The Cross and Switchblade, and you talked about this, and, and many, many people received the charismatic experience, refer to the few chapters, the last few chapters in The Cross and Switchblade. Friends, that's still my testimony. I have not been removed from that. Some of you tonight will think I don't believe in the charismatic movement. Not at all. I, I am a, I, first of all, I don't like the word charismatic. It sounds like asthmatic. I'd say you ought to go to Phoenix and do something about it. <laughs> but since that's the only word we have to ex explain what's happening, uh, that's what I have to use tonight. So, I prayed about this. I said, Lord, I can't go there with uh, Brother Jack and, and all those Methodist friends. Many of you sitting here have a charismatic experience, and some of you may not. You may be uh, searching and uh, seeking God about it. Uh, and I said, God, I can't get up there because you haven't called me to set the church straight, and you haven't called me to uh, condemn people. I don't want that, but friends, I have, I cannot be honest with myself in prayer anymore unless I obey God and what He tells me to do. And I've asked God for three days now to baptize me in love so that I could refer to these things He's asked me to refer to and that you'd receive it. And so there'd be no malice. I believe in divine healing. I believe in miracles. And friends, there's something happening in the church now, uh, that I've got to talk about. That's all I can say. Let's pray. Father, I, I'm going to have to have your help tonight. I really am. That you would give me the anointing and the unction that is so necessary that this word be driven into our hearts. Now, Lord, we've praised you. We've worshipped your name. And there's been a wonderful thing happening here at this Methodist Convention Conference. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that has been so greatly manifested. But now, Lord, whatever you have to do, Whatever you have to do, God, do it. Take the sharp, two-edged sword of the Word and drive it deep into our hearts. And Lord, we may not leave this building shouting tonight, but we'll leave this building ready to be broken. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The charismatic itch. There's a solemn charge from God's Word that every single charismatic Christian must hear and now. Never before was this charge so needed in the church as it is right now. 2 Timothy 4, 1-5, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and doctrine. And friends, in a way, that's what I'm having to do tonight. He said, reprove, rebuke, and resort, uh, exhort. 
For the time will come, and here it is, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered the time of my departures at hand. Now, friends, we are clearly warned by the word of God of significant problems that would come along and threaten the integrity and the reality of a true Holy Ghost experience. A time is coming, the Bible said, when men and women will flock after teachers who introduce innovative, strange, and unsound doctrine. Secondly, they would develop an itch for stories, fables, but at the same time become bored with sound doctrine and sound Bible methods. Thirdly, others will appear who put on a front of superficial godliness, but who will deny the power, the witnessing power of the gospel. Also, there would arise prayer groups who creep into others' houses to introduce Bible teaching, new innovative Bible teaching that excuses man's lust and weaknesses, and they will spend all their time in learning teaching sessions, but will never come into the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 6, 7. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women who are laden with their sins, led away after divers' lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul warns Timothy and all of us in the church, resist these new trends with the simple truth of God's holy word. Resist it. Most of these, the Bible says, who are directing these new sessions will be basically corrupt, and it won't take long for them to be exposed for what they are. The Bible said, Their folly shall be known to all men, those who excuse sin and weakness. Their folly shall be known to all men. And I've found something out, friends, those who teach these innovative, innovative truths, these new mysteries of the gospel, as they call them, are often corrupt men trying to excuse their own sin. They preach to hide their own folly. Paul said, test their doctrine, their teaching, by a criteria that I want to be judged with. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, and afflictions, which I endured and was delivered out of. Now, friends, hold it just a minute. How dare... You and I believe what a man or woman teaches is doctrine until we know the manner of life behind it. What right have we to listen to a man or woman until we know what life he is? Paul said, you know my manner of life. So many charismatic groups today invite any Johnny come lately to share in their Bible teaching, and they have no other credentials often than a glib tongue and an ability to turn people on. The visiting teacher or preacher could be living in adultery, practicing homosexuality, and I have seen that many times as the case, running from the law, but too often now he's allowed to gather around him a large following before he's exposed, and then the damage is already done. Paul said, I give you my record of patience and purpose and faith and charity from Antioch to Lystra. Check with these places. Make full proof of my ministry. I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. These things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. I'm a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. In other words, Paul said, Check me out before you accept my doctrine. Check me out. Paul further warns, Stay away from those who come along who do not rightly divide the word. Some they're profane and vain babblings because what they teach leads only to permissiveness and ungodliness. Their teaching is like gangrene. They keep introducing foolish and unlearned questions. I can even name them, like Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're in error. They are overthrowing the faith of some, saying the resurrection is past already. Avoid these foolish teachings that only create strife and more questions. These teachers are snare of the devil so pray those who are caught may recover themselves. And how grieved I am lately in my travels across the country 
hundreds of young people now who are involved in some charismatic renewal say, pray for me, Brother David, I've fallen under the teachings of a false prophet. I'm all mixed up, I'm all confused. Never before have we witnessed such, the, such a flood of new teachings, new ideas, new doctrines, special gimmicks, and special interest groups who claim they have the deeper truth. And it's going to get worse, friends, because now we have in all of us a kind of supernatural syndrome. It's inherent in so many groups, and it's leading to a trail of confusion, mysticism, and a craving for bigger, better, and more spectacular manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The poor little pastor who serves up just a simple, pure, unspectacular gospel teaching today can't even begin to compete with all the glamorous supernaturalists that are in the country today. And too often, if you don't have some kind of a gospel gimmick, you can't draw the crowd. Well, not much amen, but it, I'm going to unload it and get it said. I've got converts in my program in New York City who can't stand more than 30 minutes of pure doctrine when we're teaching, but they'll line up for three or four hours to get in a big crusade hoping to get zapped by some great man of God. Hmm? They come back to the center with glory reports of legs that were pulled straight, signs and wonders and blankets that were thrown over dozens of people laying on the floor. Now, it's excitement, it's charisma, it's spine tingling, it's unusual, it's crowded. And let me say something. Here and now, hear it please. It is often, very often, a true, genuine work of the Holy Spirit, and it must never be mocked or ridiculed. Never. Never. But let's go to the Word of God now and find where our true priorities are, whether you're charismatic or not. First, Christ calls for intercession above exhilaration. Now, let me repeat it in case it didn't sink in. Christ calls for intercession before exhilaration. Too many of us today prefer the supernatural displays on the mountains of transfiguration to the agony of watching and praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples were slain by the awesome power of God. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said, Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom well pleased hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Matthew 17, 1 to 7. They fell on their face. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt in my mind there's a Bible precedent for people falling out under the fear of God. But let it be known to every evangelist who is being used by God to cause people to fall out. And that's happening all over the United States today. Thousands are flocking to meeting where people fall out on their faces. Let it be known by every evangelist and by every disciple who is ever slain by the Spirit of God. Look at the word. Hear it now. No one touched them except to tell them, as Jesus did, Arise, and be not afraid. That is the testimony of Jesus Christ. They experienced a vision of heaven's glory, and they heard God speak directly to them. It was a very personal experience, and Jesus warned them, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Notice this, please. I give you Bible. It was, the, it was fear that caused them to fall out. It was fear. It was the fear of the awesome power of God that caused them to fall out. But it was Jesus who rebuked that fear and commanded them to stand up. Now, God help me, God help any evangelist who through fear or any kind of personal charisma should cause any child of God to fall on their face. 
I believe with all of my heart that being slain by God's Spirit is valid. It happens. I've seen godly saints being carried out of churches so full of the vision of God's glory they couldn't walk or talk. When I was a boyfriend, they, uh, my friends in my dad's church, people would be slain by the power of God. And I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning they were still there. They didn't even know where that. They'd seen a vision of God's glory. They'd caught a glimpse of their own sinfulness and the holiness of God. I remember we had ushers who did nothing more than carry people to their cars and drivers driving them home. It was not light and frivolous. It did not focus attention on any man or woman leading or directing its flow. It was spontaneous. It was a result of the fear of God that came from seeing the sinfulness of a heart and the pure holiness of God. Now, friends, this is not to refute anybody or anything that is happening today. I warn, though, every evangelist who has an honest heart because I have been deeply involved in this very thing. And the fear of God is on my heart. God, don't ever let me touch a man to fear a pure charisma of my flesh and ask that he be slain. I pray that, oh, mighty God, don't come upon any congregation, any hungry heart, and in his choosing slay. But then when I see that man laying there slain by the power of God as Jesus, I want to go to him and say, Arise and be not afraid, because the Holy Spirit is here. Mm -hmm. Jesus touched them, only to cause them to rise without fear. Now, it is wrong, it is deadly wrong to go anywhere in the country to any meeting to seek only the exhilaration of falling out. And it is the grossest kind of error to believe that any human being on earth has some kind of supernatural power to zap people. Never. That is in God's hand and it comes over a revelation of seeing the heavens opened. Hallelujah. And I tell you, if you want to fall out under God's power, be sure that you've been dazzled by the consuming glory of God, and be sure you hear that voice from heaven that goes with it. Now, like the disciples, we want to bronze the blessing and bottle the glory. (laughs) Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's so good for us to be here. If you'll just allow us, let's start a building program and three tabernacles right here. One for you, Moses, and one for Elias. And Peter was saying, Lord, this is so good, we just have to stay right here. Let's keep it going. We want to stay in the glory. We want to keep on witnessing the supernatural. We want to stay where God's power keeps us slain. We would like to go all the way through life sitting in these heavenly places on the Mount of Transfiguration. But it was on another mountain where these same disciples who had been so excited and exhilarated about the supernatural fell asleep on the matter of prayer and intercession. Matthew 26, 36-43, Then came Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane. Are you listening? And said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tell you here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh to his disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith to Peter, What? Could you not even watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing. Sure, the Spirit is willing to be exhilarated, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, then thy will be done. Now these disciples knew the blessing of the mountain, but not the agony of the garden. They had no trouble staying wide awake for the supernatural demonstration, but they were bored to sleep when it was time to pray. Now, friend, if it's not the exhilaration of the mountain, it's the exhilaration of casting out devils and healing the sick. After these things the Lord appointed other seventieth also, 
and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whether he should come. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by, by any means shall hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, friend, if this passage of Scripture is really true, if we're to take the words of Jesus Christ literally, then we've got to face some hard facts right here and now. First of all, we are not to praise God for everything. We're to praise God in everything. Jesus did not praise God for the cup. He prayed to be delivered from the cup because prayer changes things. I do not praise God for divorce in somebody's life, never. I pray that God heal the marriage. He prayed to be relieved and finally for grace to accept it. We are, in fact, warned against praising God that the devils are subject to our prayers. Rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you. We are to praise God, what, for Jesus. There is all our praise. That is the object of all of our praise, who has written our name in the book of life. Therefore, a true Christ-honoring healing conference or meeting is where the congregation does not praise God for the supernatural manifestations of healing, but for the souls who are repenting and are being redeemed and written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh. Hmm. You say, uh, Brother Dave, you don't believe in divine healing? I have never believed in it more. My wife came through various years, five operations for cancer. It's been the healing power of Jesus that has kept her alive. But the Bible makes it very clear we are to rejoice as do the angels who glorify God for one sinner who repents them for 99 physical miracles among those who are already in the fold. Rejoice in this, not that the devils are subject unto you. We are not, if we're to be exhilarated, it must be over the joy of sinners repenting and not of devils fleeing. Immediately after giving the disciples power over all unclean spirits and over all the power of the enemy, he warned them to keep their priorities straight. You have power, Jesus was saying, but don't exalt in that power. Don't rejoice in that power. Don't show it off. Go mainly after lost souls. That's what makes heaven rejoice. That's what make you should, that's what should make you rejoice. Heaven rejoices in what? In one sinner who repents. God is calling the charismatic movement to a new life of watchfulness and prayer. Oh, I believe that. I believe it. We are a praising people, but we are not a praying people. We want the miracles, the manifestations, the gifts, the blessings, the visions, but we don't want the hard work and sweat of watchful prayer. Those sleeping disciples in Gethsemane had no discernment at all about what was happening. The end was near. Time was running out. History was in the making, and they were bored to sleep. Men who had cast out demons and healed the sick and turned the cities upside down could not pray for one hour. And we today have the unique ability to travel hundreds of miles to get into a supernatural meeting and sit for hours rejoicing in miracles, and go everywhere telling about our baptism, and we can't shut ourselves in the secret closet to pray for one hour. Christ is coming. The ends of the world are falling in on us. Old things are about to pass away. A new kingdom of God is coming, and about all some of us can do is think about another blessing. We have no burden to pray, no urgency to intercede for our lost families and friends, no discernment of the signs around us, no heartbreak and tears for the dying millions in the ghettos and in the heathen lands. 
Give me one broken-hearted prayer warrior for every ten thrill-seeking best me Jesus get about. Persecution is the only antidote God has for the charismatic itch. Now, just in case you don't understand what I mean by the charismatic itch, let me spell it out once again in plain, simple terms. It's an ailment that afflicts very sincere people who yearn for truth and deeper learning. It's an ailment that can't be scratched or satisfied by simple, pure doctrine or the truth about living by faith and not feelings, because that usually doesn't satisfy the itch. So they heap up learning experiences, running from teacher to teacher, new truth to new revelation, miracle meeting to conference, the tapes and books and records. They go away loaded down with material, but they never really come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, friends, I've put out as many sermon tapes and records as anybody in the country, and I believe in them. But, my friends, I've seen some of the manuals and the books and the teaching today, and it's so complicated you'd have to have a prophet with you 24 hours a day to interpret for you. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've read some of the manuals and listened to some of the, the, the new teaching, and I've said, God, it, if it's that hard, I'll never make it. How in the world will a new convert make it? Well, I can't even figure it out got to have a map. No wonder Paul warned us not to be removed from the simplicity of the gospel. And you can mark it down. The harder it is to understand, and the bigger the yoke, the further it is from the truth. Therefore, now listen, the itch becomes a way of life. The pursuit of truth becomes more important than the discovery of truth. If some people ever came into the simple knowledge of the truth, they'd die of boredom. Because it's fun. Seeking the truth. You meet a lot of nice people. It becomes addictive to stay on the run and make the rounds. It's too comfortable to stay in Jerusalem and break bread with others of like testimony. They want to stay near the upper room. Now, God's only alternative is to send persecution to chase us out. Acts 8, 1, 4, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Now, friends, there was persecution against the first charismatic church. There's going to be persecution against the last one. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. How did they find? Remember Jesus said he's going to give them a Pentecost to send them to Judea and Samaria. How did they finally get there? They'd still be in Jerusalem if God hadn't allowed persecution. Through persecution... Now, they could handle demons and devils, but they weren't ready for persecution. They weren't expecting it. They weren't prepared. Now, look what happens. They're chased out of Jerusalem. They're scattered everywhere, and they begin to evangelize the lost. And those, listen closely now, those who once looked earnestly on Peter for miracles and exhilaration are now looking earnestly on the Lord for personal guidance and personal ministry. Who wants to leave Jerusalem? Man, those mass meetings with thousands being converted every day? Those unique shadow healings of Peter? Oh, that's right. He walked the street and the shadow fell. Boy, everybody come. I'll bet he had thousands following him to see where the shadow was going to fall. And they called him the shadow. People were not only falling out, they were falling dead. The full gospel fellowship meetings were citywide. People went to bread-breaking banquets, and they were tremendous. Miracles, signs, wonders, healing cloths, and the respect of the whole city. But with all of that, they were out of God's will. And any charismatic move of God is out of the Lord's will when it becomes satisfied only to live off itself and maintain the Jerusalem experience. 
Now, if God has tens of thousands of angels praising his name, but only a few men to witness, and when men do not use their Pentecost to spread the net for lost souls, it becomes introspective, mystical, and self-serving. Men become more interested in getting relief from their pains than from redeeming the world. We become mired in our own depressions, our fears, our anxieties, and we're preoccupied and building up our own faith with signs, leadings, and miracles. Then we qualify eventually for the indict those indicted by the Lord, an evil generation seeketh after the sun. Now, among many charismatic groups today, there's no urgency for missions. There's no burden for dying heathen. Too often we prefer to gloat in the last VIP testimony of who got the baptism. I'm praying for Billy Graham. I've heard that all over the country. And we've got people praying for the Pope to get the baptism when all children are going to hell. <laughs> now, friends, I... I am not trying to be facetious. I have a burdened heart. My heart is burdened. We, we sometimes travel all over the world to give our testimony or to hear one of how the Holy Ghost got a hold of our lives, yet we do little or nothing about the millions dying without Christ in the ghetto. And I, I, I've seen banquets of thousands of Christians coming to New York and sitting around banquet tables praising God and telling how the Holy Ghost got a hold of them and they couldn't even get there until they walked past thousands of drug addicts, alcoholics, and prostitutes where a handful of us out there were trying to do something for Jesus. And that's why persecution is sure to come. He's going to allow once again havoc to be made of the church and chase us out into the highways and hedges to compel them to come in. Now, the application of this entire message that God's laid on my heart can be found in the ministry of Philip. Here is a great charismatic heating evangelist who has dramatically taught what really pleases God. Acts 8, 4, and 8. And hear it good and loud, please. Therefore, they were scattered abroad whenever we were preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of them that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, and they that were lame were healed. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He arose and went. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was returning, and sitting in his chair, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, hold it just a moment. Why would the Holy Spirit stop a man of God who was doing the right thing in the right place at the right time? Jesus had commanded them to go to Samaria and Judea and heal the sick and preach salvation. That's exactly what he was doing. He was in the perfect will of God. His crusades were successful. Crowds were flocking to hear him. The lame were walking. The blind were seeing. The spirit was falling. But suddenly it was interrupted by God himself. God said, shut down your miracle meeting. You're going to the desert. Cancel the crusade. The sick and the poor will always be with you, but I want you alone in the desert of Gaza. And the greatest lesson God ever taught me that he was more interested in winning all of me than he was in me of winning the world. I know of many great evangelists that I have been associated with in some way or another. I've seen as they stood before people in, in, in tears and beautiful spirit, and people were flocking and being healed and things were happening. And then you go behind stage and you see associates that are treated like dogs. And, and, and you hear that something happens between the stage and the back room. And I often said, oh, God, if you ever use me, make sure that you get all of me first. All of me. You see, friends, with God, big is not always better. God wanted to see if he had won the man who was winning the world. 
God was testing a servant who had been faithful in the many ministries of Samaria to see if he'd be just as faithful out of sight and out of mind, away from the spotlight, away from the microphone and the charisma of the crowd. God was also reminding us, hear it now, God was also reminding us that he will not let us get too far away from the fact that one-to-one witnessing is his perfect will. Philip needed that black Ethiopian as much as that Ethiopian needed Philip. Philip needed him as much as he needed him. They needed each other. He needed to come down out of the clouds and be reminded he was called to win souls and teach men how to enter the kingdom. Now, friends, as important as healing the sick and casting out devils may be, and it is, God has given us that power. We're to use that power. Yet there are millions who want nothing more or less than to know the way more perfectly. Like the Ethiopian, they want to know the way. There was no request for divine healing. There was no need to cast out a devil. They want the miracle of being born again. Now, some of you are headed for the desert, and I say good for you. It's a dry, lonely, unglamorous place. You'll wonder what God's trying to put you through. But you won't have to look too far to discover God's most satisfying ministry of all, personal evangelism. This desert ministry is going to take you out of the civic auditoriums for a while. It puts you in the hospital ward where a demonstration of true baptism and healing power are really needed. Oh, God, if he could turn loose just one of these conferences like this, up and down the corners of all our hospitals and in and out the jails. And Jesus said, I was in prison. You visited me. How many of you going to be there and answer that? That's why when I go to the city, I have my associates say, any prison witness, any prison invitation you get, you grab it for me. And I'll go to a prison more than I'll go to a convention. And I believe God's called us all to that ministry. I remember... With this, I close. Standing on a rooftop in Brooklyn 15 years ago, I was uh, known as a healing evangelist. I was on television on six stations, and I had people come half the day to line up to get in to the meeting. And I, I really thank God for those gifts of discernment when people were called out with ailments. And I, I believe in that when it's operating through a true vessel that's sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I believe in it. Friends, it, it was easy to stand in my church in Pennsylvania and uh, when the buses piled up outside and the television cameras, it was very exciting, very exhilarating. And it was very difficult, friends, one time to stand in front of a crowd one day and the anointing wasn't there. But I remembered how it was done. So I started calling them out. And it worked. And when I went to prayer, I heard it. You big phony. You big phony. And I heard it loud and I heard it clear. And I said, oh God, please give me an honest minister. I can't allow that anymore in my life. And I began to seek the face of God, friends. The Lord told me to leave that church, leave that ministry, because he wanted me to go into a desert. And there's no bigger desert than New York City, spiritual desert. I mean, it's another world. And I weighed 115 pounds. And friends, I remember walking down the street one day and seeing five kids on a door stoop. And they were on the nod. They were falling asleep, and I got mad. I said, I'm a preacher. I thought I was your friend. Why are you sleeping on me? They said, because we're junkies. One of our guys went to cop a bag of junk. We're going up on a roof for a tea party. I didn't even know what he was talking about. They said, well, come on up and watch this drill if you want. They were drug addicts ready to take off. And a kid comes up and uh, looks at me suspicious. Said, oh, he's not a narco. He's a preacher. He's all right. Took me up on a flat rooftop, eight floors high. I, I was there in my beautiful blue blazer with gold buttons, wide tie, colored shirt, flared pants. 
Well, they weren't flared then. They were skinny pants, if I remember. Boy, and I was fresh from my crusade ministry. Boy, I preached faith. I preached miracles. I told everybody I was in due with power from on high. And all of a sudden, I see a kid take out a dirty needle. And they'd stopped in a restroom and got a Coke bottle, filled it with cold water. And here he is on this flat rooftop. There's five of them. A little kid named Shorty, full of jaundice and hepatitis, just as yellow as he could be, his eyeballs yellow. And I watched him put the syringe and the needle together, and he swished it around in that dirty Coke water. And I said, what are you doing that for? He said, I'm sterilizing the needle. He actually thought he was sterilizing the needle. And I watched those boys like animals. Shorty was the sickest one of all. And I watched them put it in a cooker and cook it. They tasted it to see if it was what they called dynamite. And I watched them take off his belt and make a tourniquet. And the veins in his neck sticking out, and they were, their lips were watering, their eyes were bloodshot. And I watched him shaking, stick that filthy needle, draw the blood into it, and push it in. And those other boys around them say, don't shoot at all, Shorty. And they forgot I was there, they were in another world. And I watched them all shoot off that dirty needle. And after the third boy had shot off that dirty needle, I passed out. And that new suit and all, right on that dirty, tar, tarry root. And when I came to, there they were looking down at me. And when I finally woke up on them, said, what's the matter, preacher, you chicken? I said, no. I said, Shorty's got jaundice. You all sawed up his dirty needle. You all have it now. They said, well, we know that. I got up and shook myself. I said, I don't believe it. I said, what do you do it for? They said, well, after your mainliner like we are, you don't do it for a thrill. You do it just so you can stay alive, just so it can come up to halfway normal. Seventy-five percent of the kids on the block shoot it. We sell to them to support our habit. And I said, well, why don't you go to the hospital? Go to the doctor. Get cured. They said, boy, you are crazy. One boy said, I went up to a cop once. I got so mad I wanted to get locked up so I could kick it cold turkey. I grabbed his billy club and hit him over the head. And they locked me up, and I came home, went right back to drugs after two weeks in jail. One said, I went to a voodoo service. I got so scared of that voodoo, I had to go out and get a shot. And one of them said, I was hypnotized by a psychiatrist. And they had a little ball and chain and went back and forth. I had to repeat, I will not shoot drugs. I will not shoot drugs. He said, you're cured. I went right out to the nearest pusher while I was sticking the needle in my vein. I kept repeating the same words. I will not shoot drugs. I will not shoot drugs. And I was getting high at the time. And I said, well, now there, that's not, that's not right. There's got to be a way out. And one of them, I'll never forget it. And that's when my desert experience became real to me. When one of those little fellows, Shorty, right after he told me a vision of heaven, he said he, he died and went to heaven in this vision. He saw a beautiful mountain of white dynamite. That's all heroin. He was sitting on top of this mountain and thousands of needles as far as the eye could see in a lake of water. And he was sitting there on that heroin pile, shooting all through eternity, and the pile never went down. That was heaven. And here he was, pointing a finger in my chest. He said, Mister, there's only one way out. Suicide or God? And when he said God, he said it with a question. In other words, you're a preacher. You're up here. You tell us. And I suddenly stood before four men, young kids who were dying. I stood on the rooftop, fresh from my evangelistic victories on television, and stood in front of four boys remembering all the message I preached and what God can do about faith and miracles and healing. And I stood there stripped. I stood there empty. And all of a sudden, all my preaching sounded like hollow cliches. All those things are so easy to say within the safety of four walls. And all the shouting I had done and all the praising and all the miracles that I had seen there face to face, hand to hand combat, I found something out I had not prayed through. I had been so interested in the exhilaration I'd forgotten the intercession. And I bowed on that rooftop, friends, and I still remember. I go back to that rooftop every time I go back to New York City. I go right to Havermeyer Street, 107, and I climb those walk upstairs, and I kneel on that same rooftop. And I look around and I pray the same prayer I prayed 15 years ago. Oh God, 
if the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the baptism of love, then there's no hope. And I saw God fill me with love, baptize me so that I can see the world through the eyes of Jesus. So that I can reach out and touch them and see your healing power away from the limelight, away from the crowds. Where, God, if you'll keep, please don't take from me the gift of discernment. But give it to me now so I can discern the sin in these lives, these young men, one at a time, Lord. I don't care if anybody sees it or hears it, friends. And from that down, I've never had a public ministry of discernment. I believe there is a public ministry of discernment. But, all, but friends, I believe the greatest demonstration of it comes one to one, where nobody sees you. No one can attribute you to being a prophet. No one can glorify you, even though you say, give all the glory to Jesus. Where no one can see or hear. Because that which is highly esteemed among men is often abomination to the Lord. And friends, those that are least among us are going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And I believe that those who serve the greatest are going to rule the highest in heaven are those who have had these personal hidden ministries whose hearts and charismatic lives have gone out feeding, caring, loving, and reaching the lost without the applause of men. I want to tell you, friends, I have to work at it even now. Because it's so easy to get away from the right priorities. Now, if there's anything that God wants for you, and by the way, friends, it was that rooftop experience, that desert, my Gaza experience. I didn't have a black Ethiopian. I had four little drug addicts. I said, Lord, I'm going to give my life to you right here and now to meeting human need. And I don't want to hear one more word about a baptism of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to talk about the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be a best me club where people just sit around and conjure the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues. Now, friends, I pray in the glossolator. I pray all day long. I'm driving along the car or anywhere else. I pray in the glossolator. I believe, for me, this is a devotional experience. And I honor and glorify the Lord in it. But more than anything else, I want God to put something in me through the power of the Holy Spirit that I can go into my room. Jesus said, when you pray, you enter that room and shut the door. And you pray to the Father in the secret. And the Father who sees you in secret shall reward you openly. And the only reward openly that you want, friends, is that the power of the Holy Ghost God has given you can be used to discern the needs of those around you. That you can reach out and see the miracles. Every one of you should be a healing evangelist. I, I believe in this conference. I believe God brought you here. I believe in this with all my heart. We have got to be gathered. The disciples kept year after year going back to Jerusalem to get their batteries recharged. I believe in that. But if all you get out of this is a praise session, and you don't go home burdened to pray for your family, and don't tell me you don't have time. If you can sit for three hours from 12 to noon and watch as the world turns inside out and upside down, you've got time to go in and pray. <laughs> Look at all those men clapping. And they're the ones that sit for four hours watching football. There's nothing wrong with that, friend, but, oh, we've got time for everything else. And if you don't take time during this conference to just shut yourself in the room, say, God, break me. And, friends, I have to work at this. I, I get weary of people saying, well, you just, you just live a life of prayer. You know, you breathe it. That's what Jesus said. You go in the secret closet and you shut the world out and you pray to the Father in secret. Shut the door. Now do it, friends, and that's my battle. Oh, God. Don't let me become a pencil pusher. Don't let me become just some kind of a, a crusade speaker. Don't let me become just one of those exhilarated saints. God, I believe in that. I do, I do, I do. God, break me and help me and give me a broken heart for this world before Jesus comes and it's too late and we have not heeded the call. Now, if you really believe he's coming, you'll do like my granddad did. He believed in praying down what he called Holy Ghost Miserables. God make him so miserable they have to get saved. Now what I've just done has not been easy on me because I wanted to come here and tell you some stories of victories and, and bless you good. 
But God had to spank me first. And he did. And I accepted. Before God, I asked his forgiveness if I have said or done anything that would hinder his work. Or that if I appear to be speaking out against any specific ministry, God knows my heart. Never. But I, I can't help but feel that the Holy Ghost is trying to say something to all charismatic Catholics, all charismatic Lutherans, all charismatic Methodists, all charismatic Pentecostals, and everyone who does not consider them a part of that particular movement. God is saying, I've blessed you. You've been exhilarated, you've been on the mountain, but now the end has come. Your cross is near. Come on, I'm going to take you into the garden now. There's going to be some pain, there's going to be some agony, there's going to be some suffering, there's going to be some persecution. And you people who have shouted and praised my name, you're going to be able to watch with me. You're going to be able to pray with me. And I hear the heart cry of Jesus once again. Oh, how I hear it. Come on, saints, get ready, pray. And I confess tonight before you, I have not prayed like I should. I've been reading all the time and Newsweek and everything, watching the storm clouds gather. I've not prayed like I should. I'll tell you one thing, though. He's not going to let me preach like this without making me do it. And I don't want him to make me do it. I want to come in love because... He draws me. And not a person in this building has been praying like they should. Not one. And not a person on this platform has been seeking God like we've been told to. Not one of us. This whole conference will be a total failure unless we hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. You're going to be blessed. You're going to praise my name. But then you're going to come with me. And you're going to pray. God, we, we, we sang with Brother Jack tonight, melt me, break me, try me, fill me. Thank you for the miracles. But Lord, if we sang it and we mean it, then Lord, let it be a prayer. Do it, Lord, break us right now. Forgive us for not praying. Forgive us for having time for everybody and everything but not watching with you and praying with you. God, make this a praying Methodist outfit. Lord, make the Methodist charismatics the biggest praying group in the country. God, give them a burden for prayer. Lord, it wouldn't be nice if we could all just get on our knees right now and start praying. Because I've never seen that in a great convention like this. I want you all just get on your knees right now. You turn around, get on your knees. And I want you to pray, Jesus, give me a burden for prayer. Jesus, help me to watch with you. Now, I want you all to pray together. No one needing you. In just the next ten minutes, we're just going to pray. That's all. Open your heart. Lift your voice to him. And pray. Jesus. Break Melt us. Draw us aside. We've been so exhilarated, but we've not been broken. We've not been broken. Break us. Thank you, Jesus. This is the conclusion of the message.
Okay. 